Hi, welcome to Detours, Understanding Acquired Brain Injury. Um, with us, as you can see, we have Jocelyn. And today we're going to talk about something that really affects all of us as brain injury survivors, whether it's traumatic, whether it's due to cardiac arrest, whether it's due to infections, whatever. Because acquired brain injury has profound effects not only on us, but it has effects on our families and our friends, our loved ones. And it changes not only us, you know, from how we think, feel, act, all of those things, but um, it changes how people relate to us, how they understand us and our roles. And unfortunately, usually those effects tend to be negative. We tend to lose people that are important to us. And those changes have kind of a negative dynamic. Now, Lisa does a lot of the family stuff, but for a more personal view, Jocelyn would be the right choice for this because she's a recent survivor, less than two years, and she's begun to see some of these effects as they impact on her. Now, most of us, um, it's been a long time for us, and so we've had to rebuild our network, our support network. But we've also had childhood histories that are difficult too. Virtually every survivor that I know um, has had a lot of loss and not only loss of ourselves, but loss of those connections. So Jocelyn, I'm gonna, gonna turn this over to you to explain you know, what you wanna talk about and how you wanna talk as if it weren't obvious by what I just said, but still. So my biggest thing that I've had to deal with is the change of relationships between a spouse or a parent or a sibling. Yeah, and everyone you ask has said the most, the most difficult thing of everything that's happened to them is the change in that. That is what has hurt us the most, is change in those connections. Yeah. So would you be willing to, you know, without, you don't have to get, get gory because this is kind of a personal stuff, and really personal. Uh, Lisa shared some of the effects, but it's a painful, even for long-term survivors, 30 years for me and for her more than four years. And, but you're like right raw with that. So I don't want to hurt, you know, make you upset or anything, but would you be willing That's just fine. to talk? Um. So before the accident even happened, me and my significant other broke up. Oh. And after the accident happened, we got back together. Oh. And I, not even a year later, we broke up again. I'm sorry. I saw it coming because it was constantly like fighting yelling it wasn't a good place to be for me or or my kids so i'm grateful it's over mm. um this relates to something that lisa and i had spoken about that you know it's like many you know r relationships where you, you knew the person before who they were before they're kind of you know, it's they 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 um it's hard for both parties to adjust to the changes in personality and way of being and all that kind of stuff. And um a lot of people will come back when something happens, even if they were apart an ex or whatever. Um, but when they realize that it's not like you know, a broken knee or like like a a loss of a limb or something like that where you can kind of do stuff to ameliorate it that this is a deep profound personal change to every aspect they realize and they go oh crap yeah and they can't deal with it and they go and that's not an indictment against anyone it's not making a statement you're a bad person. no they just can't handle it and 60 70 percent of relationships already end in divorce just yeah uninjured people and so that's kind of fuel for that kind of thing but it just makes it twice as difficult when you've got a brain injury and are trying to adapt it's difficult it's painful yeah. i mean i didn't remember 
who he was. I just right. knew he was Froyer. Right. So it was hard. But I was like, I should feel closer to this person. We were together for three years mm-hmm. before the TBI. Right. And had two kids. And yeah. It's better that it's like this because if I had to switch roles with him, I don't think I'd be able to handle it. And, you know, it's important to be honest about that also. A lot of, um, a lot of us, a lot of survivors, we, uh, you know, it's like we have the negative attribution bias problem, which is we assume everybody else out there is a bad guy. We're the only good guy because we cannot walk in other people's shoes very well. We have a hard time imagining ourselves. It's not all of us, but many of us, we tend to assume, you know, we're better. And that's because we cannot. It's not a matter of willfulness, but we literally cannot. It's like, again, like asking a blind person to paint a sunset. It's good luck. Um, Yeah, it's because we literally cannot imagine ourselves in somebody else's position. And so we tend to get angry and like with them and like, you don't know. It's because we can't take their position. But obviously you're capable of at least imagining how hard that would be. And like saying, hey, I don't think I could do that either. And the truth is, yeah. Especially if you don't remember and you don't have those emotional connections, the, the, the memories to those emotional, like, and that happens an awful lot too. Yeah. Um, you wake up and you're like, who are you? Um, it's like, you. I think I know you, but, mm, and I don't feel anything connected to it. That is not uncommon. Um, and that makes it even it's harder. like, uh, the way I always, always explained it was a stranger with memories that you have. Right. And that was it. Yeah. Um, and it's because there's a disconnect between emotional. I've discussed this on the right side of the brain between, um, well, right side of the brain, mm-hmm, between the frontal lobe and the temporal, those connections where I've mentioned about uncinate fasciculus and where you associate emotion and memory. Yeah. Um, and if that's disrupted and not necessarily a permanent change, because you obviously, you know, have emotional, you know, like connections with others. Um, it's more about this connection between those stored memories and those feelings. And yeah. it can be difficult. Um, and there are situations where you end up having to like date your spouse again. It's kind of like mm, weird. And usually it's not that selective. Usually it's about other things, too. Yeah. Usually it isn't just one person. It's usually others in your life too that you have to relearn remake those connections again um usually it's not just one person although it can be if that's the only person you've made connections with recently i mean if everybody else you've known for 40 years it's one person you made connection with but usually most people's lives aren't that circumspect um it's not circumscribed usually not everyone but usually yeah and so you probably would have had that effect with other people too you had to reconnect and the only kind of, person I didn't have that problem with is my dad. Which, yeah, I would hope so, unless you had your, your memory, like, completely, yeah. yeah. And so that would make sense. And you had to rebuild those connections again. And that is not unusual. But let me guess, that affected those relationships too, right? Yeah. Uh, my birth mom, I don't talk to. Mm-hmm. Or my older sister. And I'm assuming some of that has to do with some of these disrupted connections, right? My anger was the main reason for those relationships to be bad. Mm -hmm. And like, I know that it's wrong for me to still be mad about it. But I'm like, you did the things you did. Cool. Now, what was it? Well, I mean, I, I would never say it. anger is bad. It is an emotion. We all deal with it. Yeah. It's what, what, whether, you know, it's like how we it's act. It's not anger, it's hurt. Yeah. And, ju- well, justifiable anger. Being angry justifiably with a good reason. Yeah. And so, because I know, you know, you've said in the uh, first video that, you know, it's like you struggle with some difficulties growing up. And, you know, challenging relationships. All of us do. I mean, if you listen to the stories of all of us here, 
there are different things that we experienced that were, you know, difficult. It may not have been as a little kid, but it may have been, you know, grown up or when we moved out, stuff like that. It's like all of us had different experiences that were, you know, emotionally difficult. And yeah. yeah. And yes, we have to take ownership of the things we do, but so do those around us yeah. um, for the things that happened. And it's I a comp- don't feel like I have to apologize for how they acted. No, you you don't. I'm not saying you have to apologize for how no, other people I'm act. I'm saying like that's what people expect. No, and no, and, mean, and you're yeah. right. You are correct. You do not ever owe an apology for how others. You only are responsible for you. Yeah. You're responsible for the things you do, and yeah. for if you act out, then you're responsible to make right and to apologize for when you do bad. But if somebody else acts poorly towards you, you owe no one an apology for their behavior. And one of the things we as survivors, you know, it's like as we're trying to find our footing again and stuff like that, we do mess up. Um, And if we mess up, we can't shift the blame to somebody else and say, you know, it's your fault. But but if they have done wrong, then they have to make accounting. We apologize for our own wrongs and they need to apologize for theirs. I think it's about understanding that. So what other what other ways have relationships in life been affected? Um, Like with. You know, like, well, you just mentioned about your sister. How about your kids? My kids are great. Like, the relationship with them is perfect. It's just with our dad. Mm-hmm. Okay. But that's also why we're going to court for custody. Oh, ooh. Sorry. Um, but that is something to address. Um, that does often happen. Um, and custody laws differ, and a lot of people challenge people with brain injury for whether they're safe with their kids or whatever. I know that happened to a friend of mine um, who really did have a serious problem with um, safety for getting for getting her son many many years ago. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, and make sure you're protecting yourself legally. Make sure you're. Some people aren't fit. Um, but some are, and it's just prejudice against people with, and you know, a, a lack of understanding, which is why we do what we do on detours. A lack of understanding. Just because you have a brain injury doesn't mean you're dumb, you're stupid, you're, you know, like don't care. Um, it requires That's understanding. Why he's going for for full custody of the girls. Is my TV. I'm that that that. I'm sorry. Um, I wish you luck and make sure you you get you know appropriate legal, yeah. you know representation. I'm very sorry to hear that. Please keep us up to date. Um, Definitely will. Okay. Um, yeah, we're not a legal channel. Obviously, we don't no. you know recommend anything anything. But other than saying you know make sure you have appropriate legal defense, you know, contact mm-hmm. and for anyone watching, you know. Reach out to the Brain Injury Association uh, from your state. See if they can provide, you know, some advice, you know, or point you towards good lawyers, um, you know, to, to make sure. And even you as a survivor, um, there are like sometimes like families try to get um, guardianship and stuff like that when it's not warranted. Um, and there are legal defense, you know, things like that. Now, usually you have to be much more impaired, like way more impaired, but still. And like, same thing with like of parents and stuff like that, issues there. So make sure you, there are brain injury resources. There are neuro lawyers who specialize in brain injury, like stuff like this. Yeah. Um, so, so that obviously is a, a serious, you know, topic also. Um, and like I said, I don't know what laws in your state. Pennsylvania is pretty, um, uh, pretty old fashioned. I'm not you know, Ohio, so they're different. Yeah. That's all well, I know. All I know is for this state, we're pretty old fashioned in a lot of our ideas about mental health and neuro and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, how about like friends and friendship and re- those relationships? Friendship is kind of a hit or miss Uh because, like, 
before the accident, the people I wa was friends with, I would drink with. Oh, all those okay. Guys. And because I don't do that now, they're gone. Ooh, and that's fine with me. But it's like, I kind of miss that bond. Yeah, of course. But um, not the alcohol. Right, and that that's being intelligent. That's being smart because that really has a bad, and a lot of people who don't have brain injuries don't have the wisdom to make those smart choices. And a lot of people with get worse with drinking and stuff like that out of depression and anxiety instead of getting help. But there are places, you know, it's like there are brain injury groups and things like that. So you find in Ohio and like, see, and the thing is, as a younger person, you know, finding the, re, you know, finding those connections can be challenging, but there are like, you know, like athletic things as swimming and like, you know, running and like, um, for me, I'll agree that it's hard. And when, when, you know, it's like when you're working and like stuff, finding the connections usually is through jobs. And as an adult, you know, it, it, it's like, sure, you find your, your work friends and like people on this group are either through that or, you know, through something else. And so it's like, hmm, I don't know. I mean, so I would recommend like, you know, seeing if you get involved in local groups, you know, like either brain injury groups, which is one place and more than half my friends are through that or like um yeah like local athletic or like like if you like to run you're like like i said swim or whatever or um there there are like through your church through um like synagogue or like um mosque uh, whatever um those are good ways to make connections with younger folks um and build friendships that way that are more wholesome, perhaps. Um, I'm just trying to think. It's like, and other members of here within like detours and stuff, reach out for some of them. Facebook, I know God knows that's enough of a pain in the butt. However, that also would be a way to make friendships too. And you're friends with everyone here on our on our group, all the different yes. presenters, you know that. And, you know, but it's like to find people in your state locally right now with the plague having come through, things are kind of still kind of a little weird right now. So, but those might be some people you can make contact with locally through your local groups and like church and like. The you know. only girl that I know that has a TBI that's in town with me is a little bit farther than me. But we were going to do a therapy together like a year ago. Oh. And uh, because I guess I'm more advanced than she is, oh. she, like, the therapist didn't think it'd be a good idea. Okay. So, like, I watch her story, but I don't, like, interact with her. Okay. No, I mean, and it's like, man, these are ultimate decisions you have to make, too. Um, yeah. But like I said, through church or through, you know, like local organizations for activities that you may be involved with or just get started with something, maybe gym or just like start swimming or whatever. Oh, um, and find people that way or your local brain injury group, um, Brain Injury Association of America, um, Ohio chapter, you know, see what, see if anyone's out there in your area. Hey, do you want to meet up? Um I'll definitely do that. And like through through the Facebook uh, brain injury groups and just make sure you're safe about doing it. So like, you know, look for a young lady your age, somebody who you can check their bona fides. Yeah. That kind of thing. Because that's a, another thing to mention about relationships is like, um, they are like, we tend to our self-confidence sometimes a little shaky. So it's like. Oh, yeah. Speaking of that, it's like, you know, uh, our, us figuring the way back is always hard. You know, who we are, you know, like learning who we are, figuring stuff out like that. So yeah. hit and miss with friendships. And as we get older, you know, it's like, I would ask work relationships. How's that? I haven't gone back to work. Oh, yet. you haven't gone back yet. You're waiting for your neuro to clear you. 
Yes, and That's... they are thinking it's going to take until January to do so. Oh, okay, so fairly soon. Because that's close to my two years. You're doing very well. So, yeah, well, that's good. So that's another place to make contacts. So, you know, that's good. I'm, I'm glad to hear it because that's really quick. You, you've actually done remarkably well. Thank you. Um, so, yeah. Hmm. So um, what I'm hoping is as, you know, we, we go on to have, you know, like discussions with other people who've, experienced this because we've all been touched by, you know, damage to our network of family, friends, people who are trying to figure out what to do. And there are a lot of newbies and they're like, I don't know, you know, who I am anymore. I've lost all my supports. It's like, sure, you've got, you know, you've got your dad and, you know, you've got like people in your immediate family want to help you and stuff like that. But it's like... Those other things, especially when you're right at that sensitive kind of age in your 20s and stuff, and just getting ready to, you know, go out on your own and then something like that happens, it really kind of, it really kind of sets us back. I mean, I always say I lost 10 years um, with mine because that's how long it took for me to actually start really rebuilding my identity, rebuild everything, and then back to, you know, where I was on my feet again. After my I accident happened when I was 21. Mm -hmm. So it's been hard, but I'm trying my best to figure it out. That's all any of us can do. And, you know, it's, you're doing pretty well, actually. I mean, back to work in two years it took me 10. I mean, I worked a little, I worked a little crap jobs, but, you know, I wasn't working where I felt like I was doing something professional. Yeah. Um, you know, it was like, and I wasn't able to keep anything long term until I finished nursing school. And part of that is self identity, too. It isn't just you have to feel like what you're doing means something meaningful, yeah. like you're like, you know, like you, your meaning means something worthwhile to help you bring that sense of self back together. And when you lose that network, of friends, and family and stuff, that affects that as well. Yeah. All right, so if anyone has any questions or is everything okay? Yeah, it's good. Okay, if anyone has any questions or um, any comments, anything to post below, any questions or suggestions or anything, or would like to know anything from Jocelyn or about this topic or any of the other topics we discuss, um, please uh, comment below and we'll be seeing Jocelyn again soon and we'll be picking up this topic with other because um, it's a really good topic at Jocelyn proposed, because this is something that a lot of people ask about. And it doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter whether you're 18 or 180. This is something that um, is a concern for all of us. Changes in our relationships and our social connections and our familial connections. It's really important. And so please share this video with anyone you think might benefit. And please like, subscribe. Click that bell icon and follow whoever you'd like to and or all of us on detours here and have a good day and thank you. See you soon. Thanks. Bye. Bye.